All right, greetings, everybody. Welcome to another episode of One Degree of Scandalous with Kato Kalin. And Tom Zetter. I got your name right this time. Usually I get it wrong. Thank you, Kato. I appreciate the uh, little plug there. I was here like a half hour early, and I said, God, Tom is usually here before me. And it's the first time I had no traffic. I, I don't know why. I just I got lucky. But uh, I could see when I, I opened the door for you, something was... You can tell when you start to know someone when you're filled with stress. And you are... <laughs> obviously, you are filled with stress. I walked in a little bit frazzled. Yeah. What, what's going on? You know, I literally... I, I, t- I texted Shonda when I got here. I said, yeah, I, his I, wife? my wife, Shonda, I, I, I feel like I just lived a country music song, the lyrics. I get outside to show up here, and I live... You know, probably, what, 35 minutes from here yeah. when there's not bad traffic and whatnot. Battery dead. All right? So then, boom, I'm already behind the clock. Then I found a dog walker, okay? Because we live in a neighborhood right. that has a lot of families with dogs, and they have dog walkers. And, Cato, I couldn't start the car. I don't, there's two things I don't know anything about, dogs and cars. Me, I'm with I don't, dogs, nothing cars. And, and I'm the worst. I'm the worst. So I found her, and I knew I had jumper cables in the garage. So I somehow talked her into jumping the car. Now, I go to the garage. I open the garage door. And as I do that, the dog that we just got, that I had two rules in the house. Spike? R- like, for, for, the, for the family. There's two rules. Yes, Spike. Two rules. That's it. Everything else you can do. Two rules. No gum. Don't chew gum in front of me. Right. And number two, no pets. Just because I don't know yeah. how to, you know, I'm just, I yeah. never grew up with pets. I'm not, you know, I just thought for our lifestyle, maybe not pets. Well, we got a pet. It was an adoption. Does, does the dog chew gum? <laughs> it's really, you can have a <laughs> it bad probably time. will. So the dog <laughs> is cute. They call, his name is Spike and everybody, the kids love him. Shonda likes him. And I really like him too. So he's probably going to stay, even though we only had a one week, you know, plan. Now this has turned into Gilligan's Island, a three hour <laughs> tour. Yeah, you know, it's he's true. a little bit longer. So he bolts. So the dog gets out as I'm trying to navigate the jumping of the car and it takes off down the street, takes a hard right. And it literally went a quarter of a mile. I was screaming. Oh. I was swearing. I was screaming. I was trying to get people in front of me to stop him. Right. And he, he he got by one group. And then finally, you know, about 400 yards further down, they stopped him. So then I had to carry the dog back. Right. The woman goes to me. She stops. She goes, boy, that dog really doesn't like you. He's really, I go, he doesn't even know me. We only had him for less than a week. But dogs don't like me. It's just a uh-huh. natural thing. I think they could sense my fear because I've been bitten yeah. by a lot of them and I just, I don't understand it. But Maybe I brought, I brought Spike home. By the way, I'm going to get him a new name, by the way. Runner. I'm gonna have a new name for him next week, so I'm right. I'm, I'm I'm running it through. Uh, Boy, glad you made it. Yeah, so I made it. Okay. And I do smell milk bone on your breath. <laughs> <laughs> so what's shaking? How are you? Everything good? Uh, everything's good. You know, holidays were fantastic. And holidays coming up are going to be fantastic. Yeah. Uh, I've got uh, one of our guests is actually uh, coming to town. I'm excited about that. And um, it's a uh, somebody who works for the Secret Service. So that's always kind of a, a great more conversation to have about that. Go back into so, the archives about three or four weeks ago, and you'll see who Kato's talking oh, about. Yeah. You Fascinating guest on the show. So many times, I'm, I'm, it's it's really refreshing when people I, I sort of know and people I don't know are leaving messages and they're just digging the show. One degree of scandal. So well, it's I'm been fun. It. I'm loving it. Today's episode's going to be phenomenal. We're going to get to our guest in just a second. A famous guest, someone that's been in the middle of the biggest stories of L.A. Well, because For of you, thirty plus years. Because of you, I, I watched a documentary that our guest is on, and it was on Netflix called The Night Stalker. One yeah. of the cases in a. L.A. One of the you know crime in L.A. Just it's it's a lot of crime in L.A. Crime does pay, and uh, it was Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, and it's an incredible, incredible uh, yep uh, documentary. And uh, our guest is a big part of it. Was right in the middle of it, boy. That thing that just put L.A. on edge. Thirteen murders in 1985, all random by this it, it, satanic well watching it, creature, it, Richard Ramirez. It, there's even many more they say that uh, are unsolved that he probably committed that. There's way more probably crimes that he committed. It's uh, There were seven active serial killers going on in Southern California in the late 70s and early 80s. And, and there's well, so many the great weather. documentaries. It's it's great, and it know, just attracts the, the ocean. crazy people. It's the ocean. Whatever you know. else it hey, does. Hey, uh, let's kill people. I got the ocean. I got great weather. It's perfect. Yeah. Yeah, I'm so chill. Uh, okay, so we're going to get to that in just a second. It's Zoe Turr who was following the Bronco, the oh, white yeah. Bronco the, with OJ in it. She got a tip. The story's going to lay out. It's fascinating. We're going to talk about all that stuff coming up right after this break. That's right. Helicopter pilot. All right, Cato. 
I've been excited about this interview for a long time. She's very busy working on a project that we'll talk about as well. But man, if you if you are a fan of true crime, and of course, if who, you have memories and you followed who isn't a fan the OJ situation, please. and there's just so much more. She's been in the middle of so much of it, including the OJ chase with the white Bronco uh, that started on Highway Five, and it's Zoe Tur, a legendary. Zoe, how did you describe what your job was back then? Was it a helicopter pilot slash reporter slash what was it? How did you define that? Because you pretty much invented the genre. I was a news reporter that learned to fly. So I, I learned to fly helicopters and airplanes, but uh, I really was a reporter. And so I went out there and I was an aggressive reporter trying to beat the competitors. Did you? So you saw you saw that. You know what? I can make it even bigger and better by becoming a helicopter pilot because you'd be the only reporter that probably knew how to fly a helicopter. And you probably <laughs> thought I can get the story. Yeah, well, you know, Los Angeles is nothing but freeways, endless miles of freeways. So to get anywhere, to get to a breaking news scene, you know, in a car in Los Angeles, forget about it. So I say I can do this in a helicopter. Yeah. So I went out and uh, bought a helicopter when I was. God, what was I like? Twenty-one years old. Who doesn't do that? Yeah, I was just say, hey, I'm gonna <laughs> Who buy a helicopter. That story? Hey, you know, I was at Lexus. No, but, but I, I had it. no I'm credit. Gonna... No, but I had no credit. Nothing. I went down there and I convinced the salespeople at Bell Helicopter to sell me a helicopter, and they did. And um, yeah, the rest was kind of history. Yeah, and, so you missed your calling. That could have been a bit of sales. Yeah, I was <laughs> no say, question. And, and by the way, is is uh, Bell Helicopter? Is that uh, the? Is that like the? The Mercedes. Yes, Benz. it is. It's still oh. huge. Bell helicopter. It's synonymous it's, with helicopters. It, it is. But then I I defected and I went to American Eurocopter, which is now Airbus, and they made a far superior helicopter that can fly, you know, 150 miles an hour, stay up for about to almost four hours, and it had air conditioning. I mean, it had air conditioning. So <laughs> and and a, and a big fan on top. A huge fan. Yeah. yeah, you open that sunroof and you yeah. get a lot of air. Oh, I'm coming telling in. you what, my car comes with a ceiling fan and a walk-in closet. I just, I got a really big car. I, you know, it's it's pretty phenomenal. So if I if I'm right, I, you know, I was I was uh, researching you. Are you the very very first person to ever film the first car chase, and that became kind of a staple in L.A. It, yeah, it it was. Um, it, it became a staple. I mean, we went out and covered. Uh, the first police pursuit, and then the second one we covered was probably one of the most dramatic pursuits in L.A. history. It was a guy that came from Northern California, and he was riding down the freeway. He carjacked several vehicles. He killed a few people, oh. and he was having a running gun battle with the highway patrol. He was firing out the back of a red cabriolet with a shotgun mm. and he's shooting it. So it was a shootout on the streets of LA and it wound up into Orange County where he ran out of gas and the CHP unloaded their 40 caliber handguns and put an end to the pursuit. <laughs> oh, wow. So, wait, no wait, no wait, spin what, out on that one, huh? What, what year was this that it happened? <laughs> oh man, um, I don't even remember. Um, but er you, were, you, early were, you were chasing huh. it, right? I was. I forgot the year. Yeah. Zoe, but, yeah. but you were a it doesn't matter. You knew the caliber of, a caliber of bullet. So it's right. good. I did. I had just read a story how they switched over to this new handgun. And, uh, you know, you get something new, you want to use it, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hey, just I want to tell everybody the stuff that we're going to get into is just mind blowing. I mean, the OJ chase with on the white Bronco, Night Stalker, the Richard Ramirez oh, serial yeah, killer yeah. in the early eighties. Zoe was in the sky for so much of that, as well as the riots in ninety two. I mean, when you think and, about the history in LA that you've not only been part of, seen, documented it, and been in the middle of it, you, you I recognize Zoe. Her voice is so familiar to me yeah. just from all the documentaries that you've been on, and you add so much to them too. I really want to compliment you. Um, you're a great storyteller, and you've seen a lot. Right. And um, did you did you just get bitten by the bug? Was the adrenaline just uh, almost like addictive? Like because this is breaking news, you know, TV sets are staying on just to listen to and follow this. Just describe that rush of, of, of being involved in some of these big stories. Well, I mean, you have to understand how I started. You know, I'm, I'm a year I think I'm a year older than you. 
Cato. And so I was born in 1960. So when I was in high school, they had these undercover cops on campus and they, I mean, drug buys and things like that. And I went to uni high in LA. And so the cops, you know, there was a big announcement that they had this undercover buy program at uni high and the media showed up and I went out and I, you know, I got interviewed and, you know, the, I said, you know, God, it's terrible. The cops are on campus. You can't trust anybody, blah, blah, blah. And the cameraman, a guy named Gordy Dean, looked at me and said, you know, you're an effing idiot. <laughs> and in, within four minutes, I had the camera on my shoulder. He was teaching me how to use it. And I said, it was like the first video camera, an RCA yeah. TK76 camera. I mean, that things were just switching from film to video. And it was like this amazing video camera. And it was like, you get paid to do this? And so that's how I, you know, that's how I began. Sure. And I, I started working in the business. So, you know, uh, like, like my first, I bought one of these cameras and I started doing overnight news. I was the first news person, like, you know, TV cameraman to work the overnight hours. So like the first night I'm out there, you know, they had, or maybe the first week I was out there, they had the Twilight Zone helicopter crash with Vic Morrow and the two kids. On and set, he's running yeah. right on that set. And the helicopter crashed, cut them in half. That was the very first story. A uh, big story that we had. I think it was like the first week that I began. And, you know, from then on, it was like, you know, I saw the dark underbelly of L.A. every night, you know, murders, pursuits, shootouts. You know, it you know, it was incredible to see L.A. that way. Yeah, I, I imagine. I, and your helicopter, you, you probably have a police scanner, too. You're chasing the story, right? Yeah, I had a number of police scanners. Uh, we had them in our vehicles. We had one at the uh, several at the office, and in the helicopter we had four. So we had like two aircraft radios, you know, and and scanners and and two way radios with everybody. We talked to every police department. So constantly, constantly bombarded with noise. Yeah, and it, you know, it's such a news in the eighties and nineties in LA was just so competitive. Right, you got six or seven stations doing it, going. Hourly, just just fighting. We're going to get to a great backstory on the Bronco chase in a little bit, but let, let's start in the '80s, and that's what we had the uh, Night Stalker case. I mean, that was 1985, so you were about four or five years into your helicopter reporter career. So, were you up in the air all the time? What what was your involvement? Were you also a reporter on the ground or, or if it's a videographer? So you 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 know do both. Well, the Night Stalker case, we we had crews on the ground. I also worked on the ground, but, you know, and, and then I would, you know, during the, you know, a lot of the time I would be in the helicopter as well. But on that particular series of stories, uh, we started covering these homicides, these, these home invasion homicides, and nobody had put them together yet. So we covered like the first killing and the second killing and the third killing. And we saw this pattern. So we started making sure that we would send the ground crews. You know, a lot of these murders were found during the early morning or overnight hours. So we would have the crime scene video and usually the shot with the coroner taking the body away and stuff. Right. So we had all these murder scenes and we, and then, you know, we started hearing some rumors like, you know, this may be a serial killer, Sheriff's Department's work in something. So with that kind of information, we really honed in on it. And, and then finally, we got the confirmation that, you know, there was a series of, you know, killings related to one particular suspect. And so and also we heard rumors about, you know, some of the crime scenes, which, you know, it was clear to us that, you know, you know, people, mur you know, usually in murders, somebody shoots you, stabs you. But this guy was gouging out eyes and painting the rooms and victims blood. This was very unusual. So it, it was almost like covering the Manson murders way back when. Yeah, he, back was, in he was one six. Yeah. And if, SLB, you, and if uh, anybody listening here, if you if you uh, uh, check out the Night Stalker on Netflix, and by the way, uh, you, the interviews you did were so compelling. And I imagine the interview, I think it was Tiller Robert, uh, Russell uh, was yeah, directing Tiller. it. And Tiller was uh, just the, uh, uh, you can tell the passion you had, and it seemed like 
you were so close to crime and you could feel your goosebumps from the killings of this. And by the way, this Richard Mirrors, you just look, it just looks like the guy that would be Satan. The devil. And, just, and they were and, so random. They were all over the city, right? So you could be flying up into the valley. You could be going halfway to Orange County, the west side. I mean, there was no, he, it was, that's what freaked out the city so much. It was yeah. so random. And, well, I, I, it, it, but it, as random as it was, one of the victims, um, my ex, um, that was my ex's cousin, Anastasia, this little girl that was abducted. She was taken out of her bedroom window related to us. And she survived. She was able to talk to him on a very adult level. She was like five or six at the time. And uh, she was able to talk this guy down. He wound up releasing her, you know, so that we had this crazy connection to this story as well. Was that, well, that was the girl that he put in the duffel bag and said, you it have to be quiet. That he, I don't, I, he a, took her on the ride to downtown, left her at a gas station. Yeah, that's it. And they uh, dropped yeah, her yeah. off and said, and uh, she was the one that went to the lineup and said, uh, do I write number two or do I spell out two? Uh, that, that right. Out. I mean, she, just she didn't age. show. Yeah. She didn't show fear and fear is what got that guy off. You know, he that was everything to him. And people that didn't show fear, he didn't he, there was no interest. Wow. That's the power for him, right? Yeah. It just caused the I, ultimate terror for these people. Yeah, it's definitely goosebumps when you watch it. Hey, Zoe, the other amazing thing about the end of the Night Stalker is how he was abducted, basically in a neighborhood, right? Where they surrounded his car. Were helicopters in the air for that? Did, no, were I, you guys tipped off? Was it wasn't that no, the end I, of it? I think oh, it's yeah. surrounded in a bus. He was in a bus, I believe. That he was, but it was uh, in a neighborhood, and all the residents yeah, started coming yeah, out. They, they wanted to pound that's the hell him. out of him. Mm -hmm. He he got off a bus. He was recognized. At this point, there was a uh, in the in the newspapers. There was a composite image of this guy, and people spotted him. He wasn't easy. He was very easy to spot. He had the worst teeth, you know, a very thin face. The composite was a pretty good match. So people saw him and they went up chasing him through the streets of East Los Angeles. He went down into a neighborhood and it was at that point, I mean, I guess he's trying to get away and the neighborhood did surround him. He went up getting, you know, his ass kicked by a, a couple of guys. And at that point, you know, the sheriff's department comes in, they grab the guy and then the LAPD comes in. And they steal Ramirez away from the sheriff's department and they take him down to the uh, station down in East Los Angeles where there was a huge fight to, you know, get to get Ramirez into custody. Sheriff's department wanted him. LAPD wanted him. It was, yeah. you know, there's a where, They were both chasing where, him for months. Battle. So yeah. uh, where are you when this is happening? Are you flying the helicopter or are you? So you, I were, was over, you were aware of the chase of the, the people chasing him? Did you get shots of that? Yeah, no, I got shots of wow. when he was being grabbed. And then the other shots we had was we had a ground crew that, you know, got shots of him with his head bandaged up in the car and then pulled away. And then um, I landed and then we had our ground crews go over to uh, the LAPD station because we were waiting for the transfer. Yeah. They were going to transfer him into, uh, uh, you know, to, uh, the you know, county jail. And... Um, or to Parker Center. I forgot where they took him, but it, there was a huge yeah. crowd. I mean, like a thousand people from the neighborhood showed up and then every news crew in the world was there. So it was, it was bedlam. Yeah. You know, I think it'd be fascinating for people to know just what's going on inside that helicopter because you're watching history below you. Your adrenaline is pumping. So are you navigating the helicopter? How many people are in there? Who's filming? Who's talking? How does it work? Well, I'm the pilot reporter, so I, you know, I'm flying the helicopter, I have a headset, I've got a microphone, and then I've got this mixing panel with the different radios. So, you know, I'm I'm flying, but basically doing the, you know, the commentary from up above. We have a camera operator, and the camera operator is handling the camera and also the microwave. So uh, and then also we may sometimes have a third person acting as co-pilot and also keeping an eye out for traffic because there's so much, you know, traffic in L.A. airspace. A microwave? So, when do you have time to eat? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> have a hot pot. Hey, kind of please, Zoe, I got to throw in a joke every other 10 minutes, please. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Uh, no, but for the people, a microwave transmitter, it uses a very high frequency. Right. And it sends back a very wideband radio, uh, you know, signal that's, 
embedded with our TV picture and then the audio. So, you know, and, and the way that works is that there's this dish underneath right. the helicopter with this yaggy antenna that points toward the mountain that we're shooting to. And then it's received, then it's hop, microwave hop back to the station and then turned around and it winds up on the air. So, uh, and also I reported for KNX News Radio in LA. So it was CBS television and radio. And, um, so, I mean, we kind of did it all. Yeah. So, so Tom, your question, because it really fascinates me, be- because I always wondered when there's so many helicopters in the air, you're flying and reporting, and your focus, obviously your number one focus is safety. How, it, it, uh, are there bells and whistles that are saying you're getting too close? Because sometimes you see four or five, like during the OJ, you saw like 10 helicopters. How do you guys communicate and do this? I, I mean, I'm blown away that uh, there must have been some close calls in your life with uh, possible crashes or hitting another uh, uh, vehicle in the air. Um, I, I didn't have any really close calls with other news helicopters. I think people coordinated really well. We have an air-to-air frequency. So once we were on a news story, we would give a position report. There was only one time I really didn't do that, and that was the O.J. Simpson infamous slow speed pursuit and that was more i didn't want to i mean i can go into that that's a pretty interesting story oh yeah yeah no no we'll get into that in one second that's Uh, what i was thinking too because you want to watch what's going on down there and do a great job describing everything but then you got to watch out for kabc on the left and ktla on the right yeah it's like it's it's honestly it's like texting when you're walking in the street you start texting you forget the don't walk or walk sign and how many people do that or how many people get hit by a train and your focus has got I, me personally, if when I'm doing something, I totally forget where I'm at. And it's like I, I do not text and drive. It's like the, the – and, and you're flying and, and doing a story and filming. I'm going, holy cow, you're, you're multitasking. It's like an aerial dogfight at times. I mean sometimes – I've been up in the air where there's been as many as 18 aircraft over the same – story but we coordinate we talk to each other we sometimes stagger altitude so nobody's at the exact same altitude and with the gyro stabilized camera systems you don't even need to be that close anymore you can really you can see so much like you know uh, yeah. i used to watch oj watching hard copy on television in his home through the skylight <laughs> so what you know, that sky- that is that's insane so was yeah, that the you, week before he before he was actually arrested, right? He had a couple of days there where you were like stalking him or something maybe? No, we, we, I mean, there, there was that, but then there was afterwards, like, you know, once uh, once he was released and, you know, acquitted, you know. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was almost like being there. Like we watched, like I have the most amazing shots of Robert Kardashian getting on top of some blonde, you know, you know, this c- celebratory party after he gets acquitted. And like he's like I couldn't believe some of the things that I was watching. You wait, know, you're in the wait. A minute, you're saying that you're in the air and you're you can see with the camera inside the house at a party, and you're catching. No, foot- I, that was some of that was outside, but it, you can see through a skylight. Oh my! If and you that, wanted to, that is, that's in the '90s too. Imagine what the technology is like now. Even better, probably. When you it's were, much better. When you were it's talking about Robert Kardashian, better. there was that a, a view of the bedroom. Or were they just kind of, no, oh, okay, no, I got was, you, I got you. That was outside. I mean, I, no, <laughs> no, I hope not. We got a real scoop there. All right, let, before we get to the OJ, because yeah. that's going to play out like a movie, Zoe, what, um, the riots, the Reginald Denny beating. You know, back in the early 90s, you know, you forget how violent L.A. was. There were yeah. like 1,200 murders a year. You know, as bad as L.A. is right now, at least the murder count is down from that big time. But, man, that was a dangerous time in South Central and in that area. And we all know what happened with, you know, with the, the, that verdict and the riots going on. But where were you for that? Because that was, what, a f- several nights in a row of just chaos in L.A. And you had to be in the middle of it. Well, I mean, look, going back a long time ago, uh, you know, down in 76, what, 76th Division, LAPD, man, there were shootings every night, bodies. You know, it was not, you know, you'd get three or four people shot in South Central a night. It was more dangerous to be on those streets than to be in Iraq, Mm -hmm. you know, truly. And, you know, I worked... On, on an ambulance in South Central LA for a while as well. And I mean, while we saw were shootings, you know, and, and trauma, 
And then, you know, by the time, you know, L.A. blew up and we had, you know, the L.A. riots, April 29th, 1992, you know, when the the four police officers accused of beating Reg, uh, Rodney King, when they were found mostly innocent, I mean, almost entirely acquitted of those charges. Our reaction was, well, let the riots begin. We were down at the helicopter hangar. We fueled up. You know, I I had a, a still photographer along that day. We had the camera operator. I was a pilot, had a co-pilot. I even brought my lawyer along because I thought the LAPD would close the airspace once the riots began. And it wasn't. So we went up and... Man, you know, at first things were a little bit peaceful. And then by, you know, the afternoon, uh, we saw the very first looting at Tom's Liquor Store at Florence and Normandy. People running in there and running out with cases of booze. And so, you know, alcohol and anger and no LAPD presence was, you know, that's an ingredient that's like TNT, and it exploded into violence and into into theft and chaos. You know, we were yeah. overhead seeing the very first parts of that, Tom. Yeah, the, the city was on fire. Even parts of West yeah. Hollywood are still flaming. Yes, oh, every every oh, oh, boy. Zoe, every ten minutes. I told you. We're trying to get I'll it to set be twenty. My watch. I'll prepare for the next. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, let's take it. Let let's go to June. Of 1994. Yeah, and, and and by the way, that all that has happened with the Rodney King, Reginald Denny, it actually leads into the OJ, of which I believe was the reason uh, I've mentioned before why he was uh, found not guilty. Uh, it just was a time where, um, uh, I, and I was I, I was in the, the courtroom and I did testify for my seven days and I saw the jury waving to OJ and I said, this guy, they're not even they're not even serious about this. I thought uh, this yeah. he's going to get off, you were, uh, but you were right. Yeah, and uh, so. Uh, like Tom was saying, you, he's going to paint it like a film of how yeah. you had the O.J. chase, but you didn't tell others about the O.J. Oh, chase. Oh, my God. Well, okay, so it starts obviously on the 12th with the murders, 1994, Cato's. Cato, by the way, as those days played out, because the big thing Zoe was involved with was the Bronco chase. He was the first camera in yeah. the sky on this thing. What were you doing well, we, that week, Cato? Were you, did you stay in the bungalow or did you no, go somewhere I, else? I got out almost immediately. I moved in with a buddy. And uh, then I uh, had other friends, and I until I found a place. It was uh, uh, I, I wanted to get out of the home. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. So Zoe, I mean, Friday's when it all went down. June seventeenth of nineteen ninety four. That's when he was supposed to turn himself in. Um, yeah, but on the twelfth, we actually broke the story. I was coming back from San Francisco. I was in San uh, Santa Barbara. We got a phone call before dawn from an LAPD officer telling us that Nicole Simpson Brown had been murdered and that they believed O.J. Simpson did it. And that was before dawn, you know, about five in the morning. So, you know, we contacted the assignment desk at KCBS and CBS News to let them know that there had been this homicide and that O.J. Simpson was a possible uh, uh, suspect and that there was a second person found dead at the scene that nobody knew, nobody knew who, Ron Golden was at the time. So we broke the story. And then uh, on the 17th, I went, flew down uh, to Parker Center. I landed in a heliport across the street and I walked over with the camera operator and, and uh, my co pilot was Le Lawrence Welk III, Larry Welk yep. III. And legendary um, helicopter guy in LA. Wow. Legendary. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, we trained him and now he's a celebrity. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so we went down there and we listened to the um, press conference. Uh, you know, the lieutenant in charge told us that O.J. Simpson was in the wind. And I didn't even, I was like, like, I couldn't comprehend that he was like a fugitive. And I, I said, when you, in the wind, what do you mean by that? And he said, he's a fugitive, you know, and we've, we're looking for him. <laughs> and, you know, I looked at my crew and I said, we're going to go find this son of a bitch. And we got, the, you know, left the scene, went to the helicopter. And then it was like, how are we going to do that? Yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> sounds good. Yeah. How, how are you going to do that? How do you, where do you know? go? I mean, you know, it, you know, the thing is, I thought we all had our different opinions. Uh, 
a camera operator thought he was going to go to a hillside overlooking the ocean and beautiful sunset and was going to commit suicide. This kind of romanticized end, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, I thought O.J. Simpson was going to go to the grave of Nicole Simpson Brown and, you know, and uh, and, and uh, in Laguna you know, and you nailed it. I mean, you were right. Uh, well, I, I thought, yeah, I thought he was like, I, I kind of felt he was a narcissist from from my experiences, you know, seeing him in, in Brentwood and stuff. He just, you know, and I thought he would go down there and I didn't think he would ever commit suicide. Yeah. So I went down there uh, to the grave site and he wasn't there. There wasn't a uh, undercover vehicle, uh, police vehicle outside the, the cemetery. So, you know, it didn't look like he was in the area, but then... We had uh, we were listening to FBI radio frequencies, and they were triangulating him. And also, uh, somebody at our assignment desk at, at KCBS, uh, Mary Helen Campos, you know, told me they think he's at the El Toro Y. And I said, "Really?" And I looked down between my shoes. There's a chin bubble, you know, a, a window in the helicopter. And I look down and there's the, we're right over the El Toro Y and there's a white Bronco. And, you know, I don't, you know, it could be any white Bronco, right? right? And a sheriff's vehicles up behind it. And then another one and another one. And the guy doesn't pull over and we say, Oh, we got him. So with the flip of the switch, we were on, you know, around the world, the yeah. video, was picked up by Reuters and fed to a global audience. And so, you know, there were like several hundred million people watching this. Yeah. And we go in the story for 22 minutes. And one of the things like you're talking earlier, uh, Cato, about, you know, talking on the air and stuff like that. So we give position reports. I continued to give the position reports 25 miles away from where I was. Uh -huh. I had him down. I, I said, I'm down in Newport because all you could hear on the radios. Can I use four letter words on this? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So um, all I heard was that motherfucker tur. Find that fucker tur. Get tur. And that's like all these <laughs> right. you know, two way radio frequencies from Channel 7 and Channel 4 and, you know, cake out. And you got Find that motherfucker. And so, and I'm giving the wrong position reports. So we own that story for 22 That's minutes. That's incredible. <laughs> it's incredible. You know, if they had right. Apache helicopters, your competition, they would have tried to shoot you down. I mean, that's how cutthroat oh, it was. Would. It was insane. So just to remind everybody what, what he did, he, he was following OJ and the only bird in the sky doing it. He had the, and then Dan rather picked it up on the East coast feed for the CBS evening news. It was right. live. Everybody's watching this and he's giving his updates. So the assignment center or the assignment right. desk and the other stations are, are thinking he's still in Laguna <clears throat> right. or, or Newport. And he's like in Long Beach or something probably. Yeah, but, right? they, but they knew where you really were when it was airing. It's like, whoa, that guy, he lied. There, we got, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's lying. Go go to that site where, uh, well, yeah, yeah, where yeah, Zoe yeah. is it, now. It's person. funny, Zoe, because we had Conan O'Brien, or Conan, Conan and Nolan. Nolan from uh, KNBC, who was no, luckily no. Uh, in front uh, yeah, of the KNBC. Bronco. KNBC, he was. No, KNBC. Yeah. Yeah, Channel 4 here in LA. And he was the one reporter that got right in front of the Bronco. And you're following. Okay, so this is the slow speed chase that everybody has seen a million times. What's going through your mind? Were you thinking... Clearly, this is the biggest thing I've ever been involved in. I, I I cannot believe how many people are potentially watching this. Or were you just locked in and trying to describe the events the best way that you possibly could? You, you know, I didn't really think about the size of the story. I was just amazed. This was a guy that played golf with presidents. This was a guy that I grew up watching running through the airport, you know, Hertz commercials. This was a guy that I saw around Brentwood with his family, you know, and, and uh, it was just surreal. And just to watch the people like thousands just came out and watched it from the sidelines and watch this guy, you know, run past rooting him on. It was a circus. It was surreal. And I was just, I mean, I was just mesmerized. Yeah. Like what's, like, what's going to happen? LAPD, man, were they going to ram the vehicle? Were they going to get into right. a shootout? Was OJ going to come out and, you know, shoot it out? And if he was, please 
do it before my competitors do it. Right, yeah. sure I'm rolling and, on that. And, and while that is happening, other I people did, are – You know the news business. <laughs> oh, uh, that's what, what all you're thinking about. <laughs> while well, well, that's going on, other people are calling OJ in the Bronco. Are you aware of phone calls coming in from, I, I think, Vince Evans uh, uh, and uh, 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 a guy he played football with? Other people are calling. Are you – while you're in the sky, are you aware of that's going on also? Yes, to some degree, because uh, still monitoring the police radios, you can hear some of the conversations that the detectives wow. are have, having with communications and trying to get through. They were trying to get through to talk to OJ, but it was difficult because, you know, going through Al Cowling's phone and, yeah. and you know, you know, the phone line was busy because everyone in the world, every, you know, look, every sportscaster that had yeah. Cato. And not your number, but had had a phone number. Yeah, we're dialing it. Well, so when you're in the, when that is going on, and they, obviously they, when the other uh, news stations catch up to you, uh, and there's more helicopters in the sky, who has jurisdiction over everybody? If a police chopper says leave the area, you have to leave the area. Do police no. choppers have no? So nobody has jurisdiction no. over you to say get out of here. The only people that could you know would have. Some authority would be the Federal Aviation Administration, yeah. but they would have to. The problem is in filing something called a 9191, an FAR 91.91, you know, is that the media is still allowed into the airspace. They they can exclude airspace. You know, there's only only one time you can legally totally exclude airspace, and that's the cases of national security. So the LAPD, they can simply say, hey, can you get up, climb up? And of course we will. Yeah. Everyone cooperates. It's not like it's not like, you you know, we're fighting it out on the ground with cameras. This is it's yeah. people are, are very careful and protective of each other. Sure. We have to be in the you air. have to be. It's life and death. Yeah. You know, Cato, um, you know, this would be equivalent of somebody accidentally calling play by play at the Super Bowl. I mean, the biggest audience oh, of the world yeah. is watching. Now everybody knows who you are, Zoe. I mean, it's just, you know, we could talk a little bit about just how your life had to have changed, like from that moment forward. And I hope they treated you like a hero when you got back to the newsroom. What was that like? A ticker tape parade? No. Uh, in <laughs> TV news, you're only as good as your last story. And in fact, that's what the that's what the assignment manager said. You're only as good as your last story. Jeez. And so, I mean, yeah, during the L.A. riots, when we had the attack at, you know, Florence and Normandy, you know, Reginald Denny being beaten by people at Florence and Normandy, yeah. you know, it, you know, it's just like in the business, it's like, oh, hey, that was great. Now get back out there and find I, me another one. It's it's so how do you it's like how do you top that one? It's like almost impossible to top until the next huge crime or something happens that you catch. And then you so, hopefully hopefully are there. You know, I right? got to tell a, a quick story that I was approached by a a, uh, a startup network, a, a small one, not a major network, a cable network, and uh, to host a show. And I wonder if Zoe had something to do with this. Uh, it was me hosting. All car chases that happened in L.A. They had all the, someone owned all the library of all the chases, and uh, I imagine most of the stuff would be your stuff. So uh, your network, obviously, whoever you're filming owns it. You can't possibly own it unless you you know freelance on your own to do your stuff in no, your but own I, helicopter. I, I own the archives. Oh, so I'm. I do. I bet you were approached, but that was. Uh, uh, yeah, no, I've got. I'd watch that show by the way. Yeah, I love uh, car chases. Uh, who doesn't? It's the only it, reason it, I watch it, the news anymore. Every we did for a real. show. Yeah, we did a show called Why They Run, which was on MSNBC. And there's been uh, some other shows, but we have something in the archive. We have, what do we have now? 60,000 news stories that we shot uh, over that time. So it's about 10,000 hours of news material. And um, like like 237 police pursuits in there. So we actually went back and asked people, why'd you run? It was just fascinating. And, and so 60,000 different chases, uh, uh, one or two probably stick out in your mind. The important, do you ever, are you ever watching a chase and you're, you're, you're kind of spoiled and you say, ah, this is kind of a boring one. Let's head out somewhere else. Are there any chases like that that you go, hey, there, there's not going to be a crash or this is going nowhere? The thing is, or you never you, know with yeah, those, right? Exactly. You, <laughs> you, never you, gotta, know. you yeah. stick with that. I mean, there's some of these crashes that happen. Uh, I remember the guy on the motorcycle that hit, that went flying 100 yards in the air. This, that yeah, was yeah. That, it's just uh, people, 
love watching yeah. a train wreck. I do. Zoe, that's, that's actually, that, that, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, you know, Cato, that, that's actually a thing, running from the police just for the clicks. We're working on a documentary now involving illegal street racing. I mean, there are people that their whole business model is running from the police and capturing it on tape. And it's, oh. it's like a, a, a business. Yeah, I mean, they have the street takeovers here on a regular basis, and it's dangerous, Yeah, right? Yeah, it's it's, it's really dangerous. dangerous. You know, that, that show you mentioned, Why'd You Run? I mean, think about it. If you do 500 episodes, you'd get a lot of different answers. Maybe not the same answer twice, but I bet a lot of them involved women. <laughs> Bad decisions at the time, probably small things too, right? Like that, just no, like you would never think. There were there were a few women, but it's mostly no, no, no. I don't guys. mean women drivers. I mean a woman that she broke up with the guy, or she saw her girl with somebody else, or I mean a a woman, a jealousy type thing for the guy that triggered the reaction where he's like now being pursued by you know sixteen black and whites with their lights on. You talk, or, you talk to him, or I would think a lot of them are just stolen vehicles. That they're trying to get away from the carjacking. No, the vast majority of police pursuits are are done by people that are afraid of the police or may have a misdemeanor warrant out for like failure to appear. They didn't pay their traffic ticket. It's usually the, the most mundane, simple reason. It's not what most people think. It's very rare that somebody's really wanted for like a kidnapping or murder or, you know, a shooting. Yeah. And also some of the most dangerous people are people wanted for sex crimes or or uh, fraud that, you know, they're people that don't want to get caught because they don't want the embarrassment or they don't want their secret to be discovered, discovered. And those are the people that really are very dangerous and unpredictable. It but and also, I mean, the I mean, the other t thing is drugs. I mean, uh, we had a guy that stole a Seven Up truck who was high on coke. He was uh -huh. like Seven Up high on coke. <laughs> high on coke, stole a Seven Up truck, it, and and the doors were open. And so when he made a tight right turn or left turn, all the Seven Up went flying through a gas station. I mean, it looked like it looked like something like war. Yes, like a movie set. And the, the other thing, great thing about when you're in the helicopter, you have the vision that the driver who's in the chase doesn't know. And you know up ahead, hey, there's a there's a traffic jam coming up. You you know what's going to happen, you know, probably minutes ahead of the driver because you have the vision. You're above. You can see wh what this is going to lead to. That's true. There there were instances where, oh, this is going to end in a pursuit. You say this is going to end in a pursuit because you can see that innocent, unsuspecting person on their way home or to their job going through the intersection and then yeah. this guy going right through. So, yeah, man, I, I've seen a lot of those and it's it's not a good feeling for sure. Wow. Any Anything else from the OJ chase that a great story? I mean, just seeing the well, buildup of the people on the side of the road is you, every you mile were, you went. You know, there was something interesting, like I, I knew before Don OJ was a suspect, but the LAPD had this this thing about exigent circumstances that they went back to the, the house and they thought people inside weren't safe. And, you know, they climbed the fence and they went in, they talked to you, as I recall. Yep. And you talked about, you know, hearing a thud outside your window. So I, I never really bought the exigent circumstances argument. I think they had a really good idea that O.J. Simpson was wanted for this. There was a, um, uh, the senior lead officer, LAPD officer for that area was a guy named Jim King. And Jim King, on a regular basis, would respond to the Rockingham estate to mm -hmm. stop, you know, some of the fistfights going on. So, you know, everyone, even Jim said, this guy is going to kill her. He's going to kill her someday. And nobody did anything about it, but it was kind of an accepted fact that OJ was going to sure. probably. Well, woman. and if you see a murder scene like that, and you know there's domestic violence, a history of it, I mean, they they yeah. put two and two together very quickly. And, and finding blood on the the Bronco, the little droplets, yeah, of blood, all all the things that happened. And, and just to clarify, yeah, there was no window. When I heard the thuds, there was no window. It was just a wall. Uh, yeah, had there been a window, I probably would have peeked out a window. But there's just a wall when I saw the picture move. Sure.
So this Zoe, day, you want to hear a crazy Cato story? This one, I love this one. Which one? When when Lang and Van Adder showed up, yeah, and the car that was in front of the white Bronco on the street, and what, and a certain individual that was a little nervous about that. That was you mean what I had in my car? Yes, yes. Yeah, Zoe, listen so to this. So I was driving a a, a 300Z a Nissan 300Z, and uh, uh, it was I never parked in the driveway. I had my own entrance, so I park on uh, the street. I don't remember that wasn't Rockingham. It was the street. Uh, whatever it was, it was a street. So yeah. my entrance, I could go to my guest house. But at the time, I kept a uh, a mannequin head uh, in my back seat for carpooling, and um, <laughs> I get and so uh, I, I've talked. I became friends with Tom Lang, and um, Tom Lang tells that story even better than I do about they say what what is it? Why would this guy have this thing? So when I told the story, and they met me days later, when they kind of caught my personality, they said, "We get it now." We get, we get why you have this. And uh, I, my mannequin head's name was Dolores. That's, that was it. Hey, uh, those detectives thought that him. this guy's a psycho. It was, uh, yeah, exactly. Right? This guy's crazy. Why does he have a mannequin uh-huh. head? Very, very... He, he fits in really well. Yeah. Uh, it was Dolores. crazy. It was... Dolores probably got a book deal <laughs> from the OJ show. Larry King had her on 19 times. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Man, you know, and like instantly you were like the most famous person in America and like with in minutes. Oh yeah! I, as soon as I, I tell that, as soon as I walked in for my uh, uh, preliminary hearing, walking in, no one knew me. Walking out, every report in the world was shouting, "Cato, come here! Cato, turn this way! Cato, this!" And then I just—you don't realize the power of media. And this is before social media. Had it been social media, it'd been even bigger. But mm-hmm. from that on, it was well, yeah, it was. The rest uh, is I, history. You, know, you have to th- consider this: is O.J. Simpson. The, the case and the trial really was the first real reality TV program. And it really, it, and there was Kardashian right at the center. So you can understand yeah. how, how Chris, yeah. it, everyone kind of yeah. got it. Well, yeah, yeah, Larry King gave me the moniker, the late Larry King, the great late Larry King gave me the moniker of telling me many times of the show, Cato Kalin was the first reality star. And I, That's I true. Really so it is it true. Like, yeah, you couldn't make that stuff up. Yeah, like you could. The, the, there's just the worlds that collided, uh, the 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 time, the place, just yeah. everything. It's just, it's just insane. You know, it's fascinating now, Zoe. So you go from news clips, quick stories, voiceovers, packages, to long form documentaries. That takes a lot of patience. How is that transition? I know it's your own company, News Media Films, and you guys are doing some great work, but talk about the evolution from you getting out of the news business and, and, and doing what you're doing now and living up in the Bay Area. Well, you know, every good thing has to come to an end. I, I had flown so many hours. I've flown through so many storms. I've seen so many, you know, so many of these fires. It was enough. It was just enough. And then... Um, you know, all these stories that I broke, CBS had secretly hired my staff and they were building their own news helicopter. They were going to do it. They decided in-house to save a few dollars. Mm. So they basically, uh, you know, ended my contract. And it was after that that I said, I've had enough. And it was too much. My And then like a month later, my mom died and I started getting developing severe heart disease. And it was enough. And I needed a, really a change. And so I lived in L.A. for a long time. I was born there. But then I wanted a, a change. And I moved up here uh, to Silicon Valley. And my company, it's kind of a weird hybrid company. We have a bunch of ex-Google uh, managers, engineering managers that I work with. And then we also have the former head of Meta uh, Worldwide Operations, uh, works here as well, and we're developing a new, new a, 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 a new type of news paradigm. And so I've got all these amazing, like, like incredible people. And so we've been working on this project for a couple of years now. And so part of it's doing documentaries and building, building uh, the infrastructure. But what we do is we we build things here, and then we build supporting software. Like we have a search engine that you can search things by voice, by weather, by celebrities. It recognizes celebrities. It, you know, it recognize it, it's it's AI machine learning. So every time you use it, it learns something. 
So, and it provides you transcripts. So if I wanted to know, like, just type your name in, it would come up with all, all your appearances and the, the tracks and who you're with and, and, and that sort of stuff. So th that's one of the things that we just finished developing here. Well, don't forget us when you're a billionaire, for God's yeah, sake, because so, you're going to be. But where do you, so where yeah, do you I'm take a that? Billionaire? Where, where, will you, where will you take that with the technology? <laughs> will you take it in as a uh, sell it? To a like to a network, like what it, what is the what's that'll the, be its own platform. What's, what's the goal? What's the goal of uh of what you're doing now? That's it's it's creating news related and and um, archival related tools. That's one thing, but it's also these tools also have a great deal of you know a lot of potential for all kinds of other th other things from schools to military to to um storage um tracking it, you know or it can be sold to amazon so it has an incredible potential where you can organize everything you've got all your files any of your video files all and it's and and it's like Silicon Valley, like when they came, Pied Piper, it's instant. That's the crazy thing. It's so freaking fast. Well, and the other thing is, I had to do this because we had uh, sixty thousand news stories, ten thousand hours, and it had to be, it had to be transferred over from the these video formats to. I'll show you. You want to see? Yeah. 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 Let me leave this room. While, while you're walking, I want you to give me the inside tip after the show if your company's public or private. Because <laughs> Look at your old we, school beta player. <laughs> wow. Yeah, these are all the old three-quarter you know, inch formats. Yeah. And so, yeah, these are, these are digital oh. beta cam or uh, yeah. HD cam. And so they get transferred into, our, into the computer systems. This is Lakshmi. <laughs> nice. Okay. The smooth hand off there, by the way. I love that. The passing off of the coffee. Uh, the coffee from the assistant. <laughs> That's some damn good service. This is like. I've got one too. Head of operations, Mr. Right there. Okay. Uh, and, and what's software without engineers? Uh, so everybody. Everybody. There's Kato an and Tom. Guy and a white guy. Hey. <laughs> Guys, kick us a few stock options. And. I know, right? And then over here is one of our rooms for for uh, interviews. Sure, got the green screen. Wow, yeah. Zoe, this is a big time operation, man. I, on another episode, I, yeah. I, you're this, gonna have to really clue us in on 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 where this is and where you know I, you. It's it's like a your own news room, right? Sure. The news station, right there. This is like working at KCBS. Sir. Yeah. <laughs> These are the tapes that get transferred. And so these are the like the le the latest batch. So that's what, and there's a dog. Right, I want his job. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So yeah, it's, man, that's great. And then you got the uh, the documentary that you're working on right now about street re street racing. Yeah, we okay. we have that, and it's incredible because um, it's like if you like the Tiger King, you're gonna love this one. These are a group of absolutely insane street riders that are doing 186 miles an hour racing um we've you know we've seen several people get killed we were there on, when two on, of the, on video you've got the you've got film of that we've got some of that yeah and then we also have um we were out doing an interview and two of these guys ran into each other at 100 miles an hour in the angeles national forest and i went up you know, getting one guy back to breathing and uh, the other guy had a femur fracture. It was like in the middle of nowhere. Damn. So we were able to call for, sat, you know, on the sat phone, got help out there by the sheriff's department. But, you know, wow. we've been doing, following these guys. We filmed part of it in IMAX and I don't think we could ever show it because it's, you know, that, that big camera because it just gets you sick. It's, so let me get this right. It's it's a guy on a regular street. Like if I'm in LA, they could be doing the street racing right on Fairfax. They just start race. They they could yeah. They usually these guys go out in the canyons, so they're up in you know Highway Two. Uh, they're up above Glendale, you know. So that's where they're usually stationed. That's where they're doing this. But I've seen them do this stuff, you know, um, on a you know. 
in Pasadena on Surface Street. So what do they do? They call you and say, hey, we're going to do bring the crew. We're going to do a street race. Uh, sometimes we've been called and wow. yeah, so, I mean, we, they've given us, you know, they're it, not hiding their faces. Yeah, they're adrenaline. They're, oh no, I know. I've seen it on the freeways out here. I, I go, I, it's insanity how, how good they are, but how quickly it could change by someone getting in the, without seeing them coming up behind. How many times you get your car? One of the yeah. guys, you know, the fatality accident you had on the 405 freeway about 10 days ago, uh, before dawn, a motorcyclist hit a Caltrans truck. Yep. That was one of our guys. He was killed. Wow. I think he was doing about 140. <laughs> wow. Amazing. I can't wait to see that. Have you sold it? Or are you working on that? You got to finish it first? Yeah, yeah, we're, okay. we're, yeah we're still working hey, on it. Hey, Zoe, this was awesome. Seriously, uh, great Any, job describing job. everything. Congratulations on an unbelievable career, which the next chapter is obviously still playing out. So let's stay in touch for sure. I know. Yep. Zoe, phenomenal. Thanks, Thank Tom. you so much. Yep. Thank you, Peter. Yep, we really appreciate it, Zoe. We'll stay in touch, okay? And news media film. So follow you on social media. Get all the updates. We'll put it on the screen. Yeah, we're, we're, yeah, we're, we're starting to make a uh, presence on the web now. So, okay. You got it, man. Thanks so much, Zoe. Thank you so much. We'll talk to you. Bye bye, guys. Great okay. having Zoe on One Degree of Scandalous. That was in, that was incredible. incredible. Yeah, uh, it, uh, just amazing. It's like a like a history lesson, and she she was right there for so much of it. Yeah. And now has to figure out what to do with all the video. Sixty thousand stories, ten thousand car ch chases, yeah, just now motorcycles. It's incredible. Film. I've logged a lot of video just from shooting and being in kind of. That's a mind numbing the, job after a while. That motorcycle chase that he's filming right now. That will be a huge hit because it's sort of like extreme sports, and people love that. And this is even beyond extreme, where you have uh, you know fatalities and uh, you know you you film and you're thinking, is this guy going to live? You're watching it sort of on the edge of your seat. Oh saying, yeah, it, it, and with their storytelling ability, the way they're going to be yeah. able to weave this into a, a nice little two-hour show, stuff. incredible. All right, that was awesome. Thank you. Okay, Cato, have a good week. Maybe we'll too, wrap this friend. thing up. Uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Do your thing. Make sure you download and subscribe. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Share this with everybody. And uh, let's close out the year with a big bang. Happy holidays. We'll be back here with another episode of One Degree of Scandalous. With the man, Cato Kalen, and me, Tom Zenner. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody.